Okay, before we get into the nitty-gritty details of B-cells and T-cells, let's talk about a specific immune response as a whole, from start to end, basically, and also introduce a few new players. Now, fortunately, the new players I'm going to introduce are still T-cells, but they're specific kinds of T-cells, which are specialized to respond to specific kinds of infections, and we'll talk about that here. What we're going to talk about now is how these innate immune cells interact with cells of the adaptive system. And we can illustrate the concepts here by considering a hypothetical infection. Here you see I've drawn an epithelial barrier, for example, the skin or any part of the mucosa. And then on the outside here we have our pathogens. Here I've drawn them sort of looking like bacteria, but they could be viruses as well. Now if these pathogens break the barrier and establish an infection, meaning they begin growing to great numbers, those pathogens will be recognized by macrophages and dendritic cells, which are found throughout the body's tissues. Now remember that cells of the innate system have receptors, which recognize a variety of patterns in pathogens. Now if I haven't already mentioned it, I will say that these receptors are actually called pattern recognition receptors, or PRRs. Again, innate cells have many kinds of these, and they recognize common patterns on viruses, bacteria, fungus, parasites, etc. All the pathogens that we know to cause disease in humans. Now when a pathogen or part of a pathogen is recognized by these PRRs, these innate cells become activated, which I'm just going to denote with an asterisk. When macrophages become activated, they increase the rate of phagocytosis and begin taking up more and more pathogen. Dendritic cells, or DCs, will actually begin to migrate. It's actually the job of the DC to let T cells and B cells know what's happening in the periphery. Right now, there are no naive T or B cells in the periphery. But of course, these cells are critically important in the human immune response. So what DCs do is actually enter the lymphatic vessels and travel all the way to the lymph node. So here we have our lymph node, and here I'll draw my DC. Now this setup happens to work pretty wonderfully, because the lymph node is where naive T and B cells enter to see if there's any infection going on in the periphery. These naive T and B cells typically enter through veins which drain into the lymph node. If there's no infection going on, the naive T and B cells will exit, and enter into the lymphatic circulation, and then through the thoracic duct, where they are then introduced back into the systemic blood circulation at the left brachiocephalic vein. However, if a T or B cell comes into contact with an activated dendritic cell in the lymph node, and that dendritic cell is actually presenting an antigen to which the B or T cell is specific, then that cell will actually stop and begin interacting with the dendritic cell. And it's here where the T or B cell can become activated. T cells become activated in an area called the T cell zone, whereas B cells become activated in germinal centers. We'll actually discuss this later. Let's stop for a moment and talk about what's happening here in the interaction between a dendritic cell and a T cell specifically. As you'll see, the T cell is an important adaptive cell, and it quote unquote guides the kind of immune response that is needed. This will become clear in a second. So the thing to realize is that more than one T cell can form after the interaction with a dendritic cell. And the kind of T cell that's formed depends on the kind of pathogen that's present in the periphery. For example, when a virus is detected in the periphery, a dendritic cell will start making cytokines like interferon alpha and interferon beta. And this actually promotes the activation and proliferation of CD8 positive T cells, otherwise known as cytotoxic lymphocytes. Intracellular bacteria, on the other hand, will be recognized by different pattern recognition receptors made by the dendritic cell and will stimulate the production of cytokines known as interferon gamma, TNF alpha, and IL 2, or interleukin 2. In the lymph node, these cytokines promote the activation and proliferation of a kind of CD4-positive T-cell known as Th1 cells. 
We'll talk about the functions of each of these cells, but first let's just discuss the different kinds that exist. Parasites, on the other hand, which of course are extracellular, they're much too big for the innate cells to digest, or phagocytose, but still they can be recognized by dendritic cells, which in response will begin producing the cytokines known as interleukin-4, interleukin-5, and interleukin-13. And these cytokines favor the activation and proliferation of CD4-positive Th2 cells. The last major pathogen type, of course, is extracellular bacteria and fungus, which I'll just abbreviate BNF. And when these are recognized by dendritic cells, they stimulate the production of interleukin-6 and interleukin-17. And these favor the activation and proliferation of a type of CD4 cell that are known as Th17 cells. So, as you can see, each pathogen type is recognized by the dendritic cell and stimulates the production of a relatively unique combination of cytokines. Now, when these cytokines are produced in the lymph node, when dendritic cells come into contact with CD8 and CD4 T cells, you see that the result is a variety of T cells. We have cytotoxic lymphocytes, or CD8 T cells. We have Th1 cells, Th2 cells, Th17 cells. But why is this? That's because each of these cells is exquisitely poised to respond to the pathogen which triggered their formation. This is the beauty of the immune system. The immune response is specialized to the type of pathogen that's currently infecting the body. So as we'll talk about in a little bit more detail in later slides, CD8 T cells recognize and kill by apoptosis any host cells that are infected with a virus. Th1 cells, on the other hand, activate macrophages so that they can become super killers of intracellular bacteria. Macrophages already do this, but when they're activated by CD4 Th1 cells, they become even better at it. And in that way, they can begin clearing any intracellular bacteria. CD4 Th2 cells, on the other hand, respond to parasites. Now remember, most parasites are too big, much too big, to be phagocytosed by immune cells, like macrophages or dendritic cells. But they can be attacked and cleared from the body by using antibodies, and Th2 cells exactly promote that response. Th2 cells actually activate B cells and help them produce antibody, which is secreted and can then recognize parasites like helminthic worms, tapeworms, etc., that cannot simply be phagocytosed. Finally, CD4 positive Th17 cells also help activate B cells to produce antibodies against extracellular bacteria and fungus. They also help to recruit neutrophils to the site of infection. Neutrophils, of course, can begin phagocytosing bacteria and fungus and can also release on those pathogens destructive enzymes. Th17 cells are less high yield than the other cells that we've mentioned, but we include them here for the sake of completeness. By discussing all of these cells, you can see that the immune system basically has all its bases covered. Cells of the innate system recognize different pathogens and begin producing cytokines, which promote the formation of different kinds of T cells. These T cells, in turn, can specifically respond to the pathogen causing infection. Again, in summary, CD8 T cells kill virus infected host cells. CD4 Th1 cells activate, or superactivate, you could call it, macrophages. Th2 cells promote the production of antibody by B cells in order to clear parasites and helminthic worms. And CD4 positive Th17 cells also activate B cells to produce antibody against extracellular bacteria and fungus. And they're also involved in recruiting more and more neutrophils to the site of an infection. Now, of course, I just want to mention this here. Although the T cells are activated in the lymph node, which we've drawn here, they, of course, will leave the lymph node and migrate toward the site of infection. These T cell functions are also summarized here, and major B cell functions are summarized here. But we'll actually talk about these points in detail later in the lecture. In other lectures, we'll also be talking about the hypersensitivity reactions that you see listed here.
we won't cover that now.